Hi, this is Walter Dodd, and I'm uh, lecturing to you from my office. I had a conference, and I apologize for not having the classroom lecture uh, with the uh, translator as well. So I'm going to just run through this real quickly just to make the video set complete. This is uh, the chapter on flowing waters. And as we've been going through these different uh, sections, we can see that the flowing waters are distributed unevenly about the world. And the perennial um, intermittent rivers are in B. And we see the desert regions such as the southeastern United, southwestern United States, much of Australia, in the deserts of Africa and Asia have impermanent waters in intermittently flowing or occasionally flowing rivers, whereas the permanent rivers follow more on the wetter areas of the earth. I'm going to talk about how we characterize streams. I'm going to talk about stream flow and geology, the movements of materials by rivers and streams. So we can characterize streams by watershed size, catchment size, watershed being the U.S. way, catchment being the European way to talk about all the area that drains down to a certain point. Stream order and discharge can be used to classify streams and different um, types of streams, flow regimes, and vegetations. So we see here a figure that has several different uh, hierarchical networks of stream, um, stream flow and the dendritic network at the top, and then a fractured squarish or an elongated parallel drainage systems in B and C. This figure also illustrates the Strayler ordering system. It's a very simple system where when two streams of the same order come together, they make a stream of a higher order. So when two firsts come together, they make a second order stream. When two second orders come together, they make a third order stream. So on this figure, we have two firsts making a second, but when another first hits it, it doesn't turn into a third. It doesn't turn into a third until another second order hits that second, and then it turns into a third. While there's some definite problems with classifying streams and stream size this way, uh, it's a widely used method that does have a pretty good application, and certainly lots of literature. And related to this, if you use this or any other method of determining stream size, such as discharge, we see that on the, the average stream watershed, that the average stream tends to be small. And so we have here on the x axis the stream order from one to seven. And we have here on the y axis <clears throat> the length of each of the streams, the number of each type of the streams, and the total length. So as we get larger and larger orders, the streams get longer and longer before a stream of the same order meets it and create, causes the order to increase. However, this is logarithmic scales now. There's vastly number of, so about 10 to the 6 first order streams in this large watershed, um, and um, about 100 of the largest streams, and so the largest of this was a uh, seventh order stream in this particular watershed. So if you multiply the length of each times that um, number, you get the actual total length of a, in this watershed where there was a lot more small streams than large streams. So that means that small streams often are the predominant interface between the surface of the land and aquatic habitats. That would be important in things like weathering and water quality downstream. We can also talk about discharge as a way to characterize stream, uh, stream habitats or different types of streams. The first point I want to make is that discharge is not velocity. And the, world, the word flow can mean how fast water moves or how much it's moving. So it's a difficult word to use other than to say there's stream, there's water moving down a stream or a river channel. So velocity is the distance per unit time and discharge is volume per unit time. The hydrographs are a common way to show discharge and they're a plot of the volume of water moving per unit time over a length of time. So these are some contrasting hydrographs that we have from a variety of different streams. And so we can classify streams based on flow regime. And we have um, the top one is the Neobra River. We can see that it has a very consistent flow. It goes up and down some, um, but it does, I'm sorry, B is the Neobra River. Very consistent flow. It barely changes at all. Um, then we have a, 
a King's Creek here where it is a prairie stream where it dries and flows and dries and flows. So it might be dry or wet in any, any month of the year. In the extreme case, we have the Slady River, which is in New Zealand, that has very steep watershed and frequent rainstorms and floods so much that, that essentially invertebrate populations can't become established. So you can s start thinking about the biological effects that these different hydrographs would have. And again, we have time on the x-axis, discharge on the y-axis, and usually because there's such a wide range of discharges, these are, these are placed on a logarithmic axis. In the case of a stream that dries fairly frequently, we may have to add a small amount onto, the, onto that zero discharge so that the, there's a line down at the bottom of that when there's zero flow and the, and the graph still works. Here's an example of um, the effect of dams on the Mississippi River. And we have a really long record here from um, the 1930s on to almost to the present. And we have flows that are occurring um, early on um, in the 1930s and we have a big spring flow and then a nice low fall off down to low flow throughout the winter. In contrast we have in 1980 we have this this sustained high discharge right here as opposed to this fall off and discharge and this is being managed to allow barge traffic to continue up to a certain point and then it falls very rapidly because there's no more need to be moving the water down there and move the barges after, after that season is done. So this is a table that's fairly complex on the methods of classifying streams by discharge patterns. And it's not <clears throat> so much that I want people to memorize the exact amount, um, all, all the entries on this table, but the idea that we can go from extremes where you can have strong effects on bi biota to less extremes where there's less strong effects. So harsh intermittent might be a desert stream that only very occasionally flows, and that's going to have a very strong effect on the biota, and they're going to have to have very specific adaptations to deal with that. In areas that have snowfall, um, there may be a very frequent high discharge event in the spring, and then it might have the biological effects such as species keying in on that as a good time to reproduce because the small streams will be flowing and, stay, and, and maintain flows. And we can then go through a whole different set of these where the, based on how predictable the flooding is, how predictable the drying is over what time periods. And going from things that are super stable like groundwaters and have very intense organismic interactions but infrequent disturbances to those that are, uh, have really flashy or intermittent floods or drying. So the drying being the desert streams and the real floody one being like that Slady River that I talked about earlier where there's this flood after flood after flood. Well we can think then about in more detail about floods and then this is a hypothetical dis, uh, hypothetical hydrograph here. The time being in hours and the discharge being on the y-axis or the amount of rainfall. And so we see in this in this top graph we see this um, periods of precipitation early on and then there's a little bit of a time lag and the flood comes up on the rising limb and goes down on the falling limb. One of the things that we're, we're finding out is that the more <coughs> urbanized an area is, the quicker that flooding happens because you have impermeable surfaces, water can enter the storm sewers rather than filtering through say forests or, or grasslands uh, and gets into the water channel much quicker. And so we have a steeper rising limb and it all falls off more quickly. So the streams are more flashy in urban areas. <clears throat> and these are some data from um, Leopold showing about this discharge characteristics. And this on the x-axis has the recurrence interval in, in years. And that means that you can calculate how frequently a flood happens. We talk about, say, a 10-year flood is one that on average happens every 10 years. And so if you have a long hydrograph, you can make these estimates of what a 10-year event is. So in this example, um, a 10-year event was about a discharge of about 100 uh, cubic meters per second. The um, circles are pre-urbanization and the triangles are post-urbanization. As we can see, <clears throat> for each recurrence level, they're bigger and bigger events. And since these are both, X, uh, these are both logarithmic axes, there are about two-fold greater discharges more frequently occurring in this particular uh, hydrograph. 
Well, the other thing that this stuff this does is create um, it, it does work on the environment, and in doing work on the environment, it erodes away erodible substrates and causes changes in the geomorphology of, of streams and rivers. And this brings out the idea of meandering and riffles and pools. So a pool is an area that is still, um, not flowing very rapidly. A riffle is an area where the water flows more rapidly, it's typically shallower, and you can see the effect of the bottom on the surface. So you can see riffles on the, on the surface of the water. <clears throat> a run is an intermediate between a riffle and a pool, and the water's moving along fairly quickly, but you can't, it's not um, rough on the surface from the bottom. And so this is the side, side view of these deeper pools, shallower riffles, deeper pools, shallower riffles. But then if you take the top view, rivers and streams do something that's very interesting, and that's called meandering. And the meandering is that S-shaped pattern that they assume as they move across, unfettered across a landscape um, that has erodible surfaces in it. <coughs> and so on this diagram, we have the Thalbeg, or the fastest moving part of the channel, the stream channel, moving its way down through the stream. And we see that as it moves and cuts on the outside, it erodes on the outside, and it has higher water velocity. On the inside of that bend, it has lower water velocity and deposits materials. This leads to formation of a po point bar and erosion of the outside of that bend. And then it crosses over and does so on the other side. And this is a naturally occurring process. And then we have a couple of cross-sectional areas, just their velocity distributions with the highest velocity slightly below the surface of the water on the outside of the bend. In the middle, we have um, about even velocity all the way across. <coughs> and also the idea that there's this down cutting on the outside and then it comes up on the inside. So this, this panel right here shows the current rotation of the bend. And this process leads to the meander formation. <coughs> We'll go back to riffles and pools, again, from upstream to downstream. Pools are referred to as depositional habitats. That is, they're collecting sediments. Riffles are referred to as erosional habitats. They're losing materials. And <clears throat> oftentimes in streams, we'll have a, some groundwater flow underneath. And you can particularly imagine this happening in a rocky riffle that doesn't have much space between, and there's this hydraulic head between the top and the bottom. And it forces some flow to go through underneath. And we'll see their biological uh, relationships that are based on this. <clears throat> now as rivers um, and streams move across the landscape, they erode out these, um, these meanders and eventually the meander will, will erode on the, outs on the outside and continue to erode on the outside and if it goes far enough it'll pinch itself off creating an oxbow. So when we get into a floodplain, and that's the area where the river is doing its active geomorphic work, and it's fairly flat, we see that over hundreds or maybe thousands of years that the river moves its way back and forth across this landscape and leaves these depressions. <coughs> and so that's in A. In B, we see how these lead to habitats. It can lead to marsh habitats, lakes, semi-connected parts to, to the river a whole variety of different habitats. And that complexity is very important biologically because different organisms specialize in these different areas. And then you can have, when streams come together, they can have geomorphological effects. So this is a, a river in the southeastern United States. And you can see there's one coming in from the side here. And then the flow, direction of flow is from the bottom to the top of the image. And where this river is putting materials into the, to the larger river, it actually causes a rapid to form because it sort of dams the river behind it and then it's falling down over that material. One of the things that's really changed geomorphology in a lot of Appalachian streams is this idea of mountaintop mining. And this is a very strong effect that humans have because what the coal companies do is they just rip the tops of the mountains off to get at the coal underneath the surface of the mountain. <coughs> but then they have all this material that they take off of the mountain and they have to do something with and they just put a shit down into the river valleys and they make these flat top things as opposed to this more mountainous area. <clears throat> so essentially they just fill the whole stream channel, the stream valley up and they make this 
a flat thing and the stream valley is filled with this muddy loose stuff which can then f flood down and also ha um, and cause like massive landslides and problems there but also can cause big water quality problems because it is releasing all these materials and allowing them to weather very quickly into the watershed and the fine sediments that can then harm organisms are either toxic or they're toxic to organisms or they smother these organisms. This is uh, an ongoing political battle in the United States whether this should be allowed. <clears throat> Another way that people have modified rivers and streams is by channelizing and they tend to do this on most major rivers and streams. Um, in the agricultural areas you'll see straight ditches in rivers, um, a lot of them have been modified originally for navigation and then also for flood mitigation. This is an example of channel modification from Oregon and the Willamette River, as they uh, call it there. And we see from um, the early 1900s to the present a lot more simple channel. And so what's happened here is that the channel's been deepened and straightened in parts of the center and wetlands and side channels have been drained for agricultural use. So these all lead to um, a much more simple system, much less habitat for organisms that depend on anything other than that fast water moving down the center of the channel. In addition to that, um, in addition to that, uh, these formations of these levees and um, ways to constrain rivers from flooding really do cause some problems uh, upstream and downstream of the levees. So if you put a levee in a river and a flood comes, it may keep the water from moving out to the sides of the stream channel, of the river channel, but it'll cause a sort of a dam, and so it'll cause flooding to be worse above, and then once it gets below, it'll really be moving along and spread out um, with, with high water velocity. In addition to that, um, if it does top over the levee, then it has a lot of activity and it can scour out really badly, so the flood can be even more severe. All of these are are ways that we're modifying hydro hydrology of re river and stream channels and changing the basic habitats that say fish are adapted to spawning in these side habitats that are going away. Um, material flow, and we'll talk about these when we get to the ecosystem chapter. <clears throat> so this is a uh, table that has a bunch of different uh, materials that get dissolved in nitrogen, calcium, magnesium, sodium, etc. And the current concentration of rivers of the world, the natural concentration of the uh, rivers of the world, and how much humans have increased these. So we have 9 or 10% increases in uh, calcium and magnesium, 40% increases in sulfate, 50%, 30 to 50% increases in dissolved phosphorus. So rivers can move a lot of material, but the human activities have made, us, made it so much more is coming off the landscape than would historically. We can also think more specifically about how dissolved materials move through rivers or streams. And this is an example of a, a, a plot of a release of salt at, where it's, at the point where it's released and a point 100 meters downstream. And it's just a graph of what happens over time. <clears throat> and so if we just have a pump and we turn it on for say 30 minutes at zero meters and then we let go 100 meters down and we sample what happens as that moves downstream. We see that that pulse tends to spread out, that some parts of the river are moving faster than others, and so we get this tailing edge that gets down here pretty quickly. It starts to come up to um, what it was before, and then it tails off. And this tailing off indicates that there's places in the stream where materials are stored, that they're, they're called transient storage zones, and it gives you an idea of the amount of alternative habitat. And again, if you remember, we had riffles and pools, we had a thou leg, we had slow moving portions. We had areas like gravel bars where water was flowing underneath it. Those slow areas like the gravel bars or the backwaters of the pools are what are allowing this to trail out. So we see then that the river has these physical effects on the way that, that materials move down. Rivers are also, um, doing erosion all the time, and we've already uh, referred to that, but you can imagine that the rates of erosion are dependent upon the size of the particles and the water velocity. Um, so we have on this the size of particles going from um, 10 to the minus third millimeters, so that's a micron, right? And up to a thousand millimeters, which is say a meter. And 
We have, so these might be boulders on this, this side and, and very fine clays on this side. And we have water velocity of centimeters per second. So 10, 10 to 100 centimeters per second, that's, that's a, a stream that's moving along pretty well. Yep. <clears throat> and we see that at these higher um, water velocities. We, the first one we can talk about, fall velocity, and that is you need more and more water velocity to pick up an object and move it along until you have a really raging flood that can perhaps move boulders around. Um, and then you get up to a certain point and not much water velocity. You can move clay almost all the time and silt and fine sand, you need a little bit of a flood. The other thing that's interesting that happens here is that we actually have this um, sort of compaction thing where the edge of the stream bank is, is, is basically pushed and it's not eroding away, but there's a lot of transport. And so this is, you'd expect this erosion, I would expect this erosion to follow this curve here, but it actually, it turns out that, that fine sediments can be more resistant at higher water velocities up to a point and then they lose that ability. So that's kind of interesting, but it gives you an idea of how erosion occurs and transport occurs as a function of water velocity. And I can go more into this idea of, of water moving, moving um, s solids as a function of size. So again, we have the sediment size in millimeters, um, where we have a millimeter here, um, a tenth of a millimeter there, maybe a couple millimeters there. And we have a percent by weight in, in two floods, one that's about six cubic meters per second, one that's 20 six cubic meters per second. And we see that the slower moving water has a higher percentage of small particles in it, and the faster moving water has a greater proportion of large particles in it. And as we've seen several places in this class, uh, we talk about the idea of scale going from um, time scales, which are uh, very, very small uh, in the order of, of seconds, or less to the age of the earth, perhaps, and spatial scales that are the size of microbes down all the way up to, say, continents. And then we can think about the way habitats are um, distributed over those. And, and the stream people really got me onto this idea. Uh, Stan Gregory and some of my colleagues have, have been uh, talking about this kind of thing uh, for, for many years. And it's a useful way to think about the way the habitat actually um, is organized with regard to the organisms that live on it. So we can think of particle and dynamics happening on very small particles, maybe the size of mo mo microbes. Then we have wood, maybe riffles and pools, and eventually we get up to large watersheds, even large enough to, to be, drain a whole continent, like the Mississippi River or the Amazon, and drain much of a continent. And then we have the biological aspect laid on top of that, where we have the microbes operating down in this scale, macroinvertebrates and fish sort of operating in the wood, particle, pool riffle area, um, logs and trees falling into streams and lasting for quite a bit longer, um, and ecosystem engineers maybe making changes here. And then we get to humans who are making the changes all the way across this with things like global climate change and damming most of the rivers in the world and uh, water extraction. And that finishes the lecture on the very abbreviated lecture on streams. Just again, apologize for it not being in the same format, apologizing for being maybe more, uh, less, less of a performer if I don't have a class audience in front of me. And thanks for your time.